In this edition of Detroit Performs, a photographer and pianist collaborate to showcase an urban recreational path in Detroit. So as an audience uh, participant, you uh, can get lost looking at this image uh, that is projected on me plus the back wall. Citizens critique art happenings around the area. It's a one person, one night show and every third Thursday. A poet's words bring a deeper sense to Detroit pictures and film. From streetcars and urban sprawl to assembly lines and ballroom halls. A compelling exhibition shows the human side of war. War is an entity uh, on its own and photography is an entity on its own and this exhibition is about the coming together of both. And a photographer on a mission to document the American frontier. I treated this in a lot of ways just like it could have been shot, you know, a hundred years ago. It's all ahead in this edition of Detroit Performs. Major funding for Detroit Performs is provided by the McGregor Fund. Additional funding is provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and the National Endowment for the Arts. And by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, I'm DJ Oliver and this is Detroit Performs. Now as one of the world's most famous photographers, Ansel Adams said, a great photograph is one that fully expresses what one feels, in the deepest sense, about what's being photographed. Each artist highlighted in today's show exemplifies this thought. Now we are here at Detroit to Quindercut Greenway, the inspiration for photographer and filmmaker Michelle Adonian and musician and composer Luis Resto's film, The Cut, which tells the story of the past's constant changes while holding on to its past. We're here in downtown Detroit on an abandoned train line which runs right through the middle of the city. Uh, starts at the riverfront and from the riverfront up till Gratiot right now it's a bike path called the Dequinder Cut. This area will be joining the Dequinder Cut over the next year and a half. Um, so this is really a piece of Detroit that has gone back to what it was like over a century ago. Luis Resto and I had been talking about collaborating together on a project. He's a musician um, based in Detroit, but uh, has an incredible history in all genres of music. He um, used to, he was inspired by his grandmother who used to play piano for silent movies. He's a pianist and um, we wanted to tell a story about Detroit. When I first looked down on the Dequinder Cut and knew that it was going to be renovated into a bike path, I wanted to be able to photograph the changes and capture them because that's what I love about photography, it's a, is its ability to hold on to the past. I've been down here photographing for almost a year and um, I've been capturing it in different seasons. Uh, it's just really interesting to see how the landscape evolves and changes along with the graffiti. It's just really inspiring. So what I ended up photographing down in the Dequinder Cut and making out of the imagery and motion was a silent movie that he could improvise music to. This is an area that I keep coming back to. I've been here in the summer, in the winter, in the fall, and now it's spring. I'm tracking these, photographing these vines, this vine that flows in down around the building. It's just a great timeline 
for the whole piece. The cut, uh, when you walk into the performance space, you're looking at a setup of an acoustic piano um, with various electronics on top of it and uh, white perf perf boards on it, right? Yeah, foam core. Foam core. So and it's foreground background. I come in and sort of get into a cockpit <laughs> and lights go down and these images of the De Quinder cut are projected on not only a scrim behind me and the uh, what is this called? foreground, uh, the foreground, but on me as well because I'm in a white shirt. Uh, last performance we did a white jacket. So as an audience uh, participant, you uh, can get lost looking at this image uh, that is projected on me plus the back wall, and sometimes I disappear. I improvise and react to visual, to sonic, um, to artists pretty, pretty easily. So when I saw Michelle's images, I just, you know, start playing. And that's, um, so that part wasn't too tough. It, it, I just start and go and something comes out and then I react off of that and go on to the next point. And uh, that's where then, the two, the, the two uh, forms, the, the visual and the sound, start kind of interweaving, you know, because I've, I've um, improvised forever, but uh, visually and letting that into the, the spectrum, uh, that's, uh, they, they become unified at that point. And I think that's where the piece then becomes the collaboration, just like a, uh, a ballet piece, you know, where the music that uh, is written for it becomes one at that point. Luis Resto also has one of the most memorable piano lines, as well as co-wrote the biggest hit to come out of Detroit in years, the Grammy and Oscar-nominated song, Lose Yourself by Eminem, one of my favorite y'all. To learn more about Luis and Michelle, visit michelleladonian.com and luisresto.com. Now each week, Detroit Perform highlights the works of a mobile arts journalism team, Critic Car Detroit. I'm Vado, I am Vice President of the Scarab Club, and I'm co-curator of the Third Thursday Emerging Artist Showcase. We started this about a year ago. Um, every month we have an artist that's an up-and-comer in the neighborhood or in the Metro Detroit area uh, for January to November. It's a one-person, one-night show on every Third Thursday. In December we have a group show, we invite all 11 artists back, and they can uh, exhibit how they want. The artists can set up the room, they can do whatever they want, just can't take the word off, work off the wall, because it's an existing show. Uh, one of the things that we like to say of our giving back to the artists is that uh, every 100% of whatever the artist sells tonight goes back to the artists. So the club keeps nothing. Um, and we hope that this uh, you know, continues on uh, for years to come. I hope that other people emulate it. But it's, you know, it's kind of our way of giving back and uh, bringing up new artists and, and, and helping them grow in the art community. You can view more Credit Card Detroit's reviews on their Facebook page and YouTube channel. And now, here's a look at some of the arts events happening this week in our community.
poet Victor Walker's words are put to photography and film in his poem, Undercurrent. Our darkest moment exits when the sun kisses the river. A current pushes against the shore, ebbs and flows, waning and weak, a metaphor for people held captive by history, burned by misery flowing sweetly from streetcars and urban sprawl to assembly lines and ballroom halls, through closed mines and open roads, smoky lounges, abandoned homes, spines arched like monuments to a crippling struggle. We have endured but ask if this is where old movements go to die. They rest in shadows or howl like banshees, deep lingering moans cemented in nostalgic rifts captured in our souls. Unworthy martyrs tied to unsavory legacies remind us that freedom is not free. We salvage from wreckage an identity that quite possibly never was. Illusions plastered upon marquees too bright for our eyes. Our brothers walk Monroe Block, looking for new ways to capture old dreams, find nothing more than gutted remnants of what used to be. We remember how our sisters danced in vanity, while we reduced their bodies to silhouettes, heard them chant to stay alive as our cities were occupied, held signs announcing rebirth, but this renaissance numbed us, froze us with missed opportunity. Landscapes of urban myths contradict stories living in the bones of our brazen. Dignity held ransom by politicians separating us from salvation. We walk north as the spirit of Detroit watches over us. Turn west where industry emptied our pockets. Detour down 12th Street where they would rather burn it down than allow for tyranny. No reparations for the many still there. We remain. Communities driven by nothing more than hope. There should be more places for hope. Places to plant promise and grow change where people of various hues refuse to plaster the news with stories of how we sacrifice one another. We must learn to trust each other. Push back against the current flowing under us. Stand proud in the wake of what we have made. Ask ourselves if we can remain diligent as our darkest moment finally exits. It took a decade for the Museum of Fine Arts Houston to collect the items on display for their groundbreaking exhibition, War Photography. The exhibit explores the war through the lens of more than 280 photographers from 28 nations and spans 165 years from the mid-1800s to present-day conflicts. The exhibition War Photography has a slash between war and photography because we began with the premise that war is an entity on its own and photography is an entity on its own and this exhibition is about the coming together of both. From the beginning we wanted only the strongest photographs we could find. Those that live on past the historical moment. Those that, if you know nothing about the war in Bosnia or the civil wars in Africa or any of the other conflicts, there's something in that photograph that engages you on a personal level. One of the critics used the word heart. And that's an odd word to use in an art review. But I'm glad because we felt sympathy for the men and women who were fighting. We felt sympathy for the civilians who were caught in the crossfire. And we tried to organize the exhibition in such a way that there's a balance between the really tough sections and sections where the soldiers are having fun. You know, they're wrestling with each other and they're playing cards. There are people playing cards from the 19th century right up to the Iraq war. We wanted to show that everybody's human, that they have these complex personalities. We didn't want to simplify the story. During the, the kind of breakup of the Soviet Union, there was a republic in the south of Russia called Chechnya, a very tiny place. It's probably not bigger than the size of Connecticut. This place historically had a, a problem with Russia, never really wanting to be a part of Russia. So it became a huge outbreak of war. And I really wanted to show just the experience of you know, all these, these kids basically being sent down. 
He was a member, of part of a tank force, and they had been ambushed, and a lot of his colleagues had been killed. And he was sort of in a sort of a shell shock. I could see it was very hard to talk to him at that moment. And then he got whisked away. We all think photography could, you know, end war, and but I somehow think it will be with us, unfortunately. <laughs> And I think the power of photography is somehow, it, at least it's a, it's a document, and it tells the story, which becomes very important, of a lot of people who, whose stories would just disappear. I have a son who would have been a, of draft age, and I thought if he went to war, how would he recover from that? And so as a portrait photographer, I was interested in meeting um, men and women who volunteer for service. I photographed everybody standing in sort of head and shoulders uh, portrait and then I asked everybody to put their head on the table and I've made photographs like the one of Soldier Burkholz. Craig Burkholz had served two tours, a tour in Iraq and a tour in Afghanistan. He came home, he got married, went to school, became a police officer which is what he'd always wanted to do and then was killed at a domestic abuse call and the shooter was another Iraq vet. His mother wrote to me and said, please send me a picture of him because his time in Iraq and Afghanistan was very hard on him and his family. And this image portrays his trials. It's a very powerful collection of images, but we really felt that if we were going to tell the story, we had to tell the story, the full story. This is the photograph of my class when we were 13. This picture somehow narrates the story of a generation, my generation, that was affected by a military dictatorship. Well, many of us were against the dictatorship. The victims were just kidnapped, taken from their homes, killed, tortured. In order to overcome the pain of, of these absences, uh, I had a tool, and the tool was photography. I decided to write on that picture with the fate of each one of my classmates. Martin is in the picture just beside me. He was 13 in the moment of the picture and uh, he was uh, in 76, 22 when he was kidnapped and disappeared. There is the case of uh, Jorge. He wasn't kidnapped, but he got crazy. Claudio, who is beside him, was shot in the street. And Eric got fed up and he went to Madrid and there he is now. Ruth is in Helsinki. Anna Murlender is in Israel. And these are the consequences of exile. These are the consequences of violence. We all have the class picture. Therefore, it's in a way a universal image. We all study it in a way or another and have this kind of image. And therefore, it is not referring only to me, to my generation, but in a way to any class that can be affected by uh, terror, by violence, by war. One of the key words for us in putting this exhibition together was respect. Respect for the veterans, for the people who served or who are serving. Respect for the photographers. My grandfather served on the docks of Morocco and Italy and South Africa, you know, dispersing the troops, getting them to where they needed to be, and uh, getting them the, the um, supplies that they needed. So he took a lot of pride in that and spoke about it every chance he got. The image is from a closet in their bedroom. It has his helmet and a walking cane and his belt from World War II. There's a universal connection to it. I think everybody's obviously lost you know, a family member to whether it's war or just uh, lost their family member and kind of had to deal with uh, the things that they've cherished and stockpiled over the years. One of the men who works here at the museum said that after seeing the exhibition, he can talk to his brother who's stationed in Afghanistan and have a better understanding of what his brother's going through. That made us feel great. We tried to be inclusive of everybody and everything that is affected in some way by all the ramifications of a conflict situation. For more information, visit mfah.org. 
Now, next up, we meet photographer Scott Baxter, who has found inspiration in the American frontier. For most of the last decade, Scott Baxter has photographed over 100 cattle ranchers and their family-owned ranches. And as you'll see in our profile segment, he's found a way of preserving centuries-old traditions of America's true cowboys. Some of these ranches that we're photographing aren't going to be around because uh, you know development's going to find it, you know, its way in. And, and there's a lot of ranches I know that there's no one coming up behind them, so they'll most likely be sold. And I just thought, what if photographically I could at least try to record some of these families that've been around here since, you know, since 1912 or earlier? And that's it. Kind of started that way. I didn't really plan to do anything with it. I just wanted to see if I could accomplish it. We call it 100 years, 100 ranchers. And basically the criteria is the family has been ranching in Arizona continuously since 1912 or earlier. My ancestors came here from Valencia, Spain in the 1840s, and they were coming to Tucson by covered wagon. This is the uh, Amado family, my great grandfather. About 1852 is when they set up the ranch at Alamo Bonito in what is called Amado. This family is a very historic family, goes back a long ways, and a beautiful ranch, too. And one of my, uh, Santa Cruz County is probably one of my favorite places to be in the whole state. Photographs should be really easy for you to look at. You know, it doesn't mean it has to be Pollyannish or, you know, beautiful or anything. It just has to be easy. And if it's easy, it's good. And then, uh, Henry, just kind of right in the middle. If I push too hard, if I really try too hard to push a photograph, it just doesn't work out for me. I kind of let the photograph come to me. There's not a set process. I want to get this side too because it's got your brand on the horse's shoulder. I have, you know, aside from scouting a little bit the day before and knowing I wanted to use that big sycamore tree, I don't, there's not a, you know, I don't have like a list of what I'm going to do. I just kind of walk in and, and it's kind of the way I've always worked. I just kind of wing it and, and uh, it kind of works for me. It doesn't work for everybody, but it works for me. Perfect, guys. Okay. The last one with this camera, for now at least. I was standing there. Okay, straight in. Last evening by the tree with, uh, between two horses and okay, with my son and grandson on each side of me. Very proud. It just gives you an idea. It's a small shot. Now you gotta kinda look at it, but. You wanna show that pride? I mean, they're very, as a group, they're they're very proud of, of their of their heritage. They're very proud of what they do. So that's kind of where we're at. So we're gonna we're gonna shoot a few more with this camera. With the portraits, you just kind of, you know, you kind of take a little more time and kind of get your frame up the way you want it, and then you, you know, you read your light and you shoot it. Five, six, one, twenty-five. Well, I think it's a wonderful thing that 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 Scott came up with this idea. But this is actually very nice where we're at now. It's recorded history. I don't think they're really looking for recognition, but I think they like the fact that there's going to be a record of this somewhere for, you know, for their kids. I treated this in a lot of ways just like it could have been shot, you know, 100 years ago. I bring a digital with me, but that's just to shoot stuff for them. But we're shooting just straight black and white film, no lights. So it's basically camera film and a tripod. And that kind of forces me to really think about my composition a lot because I don't have a lot of tricks in my bag and it kind of makes you think a little bit more as a photographer. Now this one is a little bit more, this is like the old style. This oh takes, no, it won't, it won't, won't blow up. Yeah. I've not had a bad experience, and I've got a story for every single ranch that I've been at. That's perfect right there, hold that. You know, the photographs are kind of the icing on the cake, but, but the real thing is, I, I just. Thank you, sir. It's in. Yeah, that's it. You know, they're a great group of people. And I, I've just been real honored to, to have the opportunity to meet them and spend some time with them. They're all hardworking. They're just hardworking people who just like, they, they love what they do. You know, and they really love the land. I mean, that's, that's the thing that I've kind of come away with is they, are re they really love this land and they really want to take care of it. Baxter has wrote a book for his 100 Years, 100 Ranchers project. To learn more, visit 100years100ranchers.com. 
And that wraps it up for this edition of Detroit Performs. For more information on arts and culture, you can visit DetroitPerforms.org, where you'll find featured videos, blogs, and upcoming information on arts events. Until next Tuesday, I'm DJ Oliver. Thanks for watching, guys. Major funding for Detroit Performs is provided by the McGregor Fund. Additional funding is provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and the National Endowment for the Arts. And by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.